I want to talk about today, and, and, but I also want to, I'll be reflecting back on who we were and how we got where we are in this time. I want to state the obvious to begin with, and that is that the global economy has fundamentally changed the importance of education. My parents' generation didn't necessarily need to give everybody a great education. In 19, I was born in 1947. In 1950, 85% of the jobs in the United States economy were for unskilled laborers. Not skilled laborers like the machinists, mechanics, and carpenters I was talking about. Unskilled laborers. The truth is you didn't necessarily need the kind of education that you absolutely need today in order to succeed in the global economy. And I have to say, as students of educational leadership, if you haven't read The World is Flat by Thomas Friedman, you really ought to read it. I bet several of you have. And the truth is that he says in this book, quote, young Chinese, Indians, and Poles are not racing to the bottom. They are racing us to the top. They do not want to work for us. They don't want to be us. They want to dominate us in the sense that they want to cre be creating the companies of the future that people all over the world will admire and clamor to work for. We are not the only game in town. And we're not even in a bipolar world when you could argue there's a Soviet Union in the United States. We are in a multipolar world with very serious countries investing deeply and heavily in the preschool for all, in you know, the equivalent of our K-12 system for all, and in systems of post-secondary education, including higher ed. The Chinese have something like 360 new colleges under construction this afternoon. So the truth is that the, the, a great many of the jobs going overseas today are no longer the low-end jobs. That isn't just where we get our fabric made. That is, in fact, now where the high-end jobs have been going for some time. And if we don't wake up, and smell the coffee. Look, do you realize that, according to Friedman, 60% of the nation's top graduates in science and 65% of the nation's top college graduates in mathematics are first-generation Americans? The reality is that every year the United States par takes part in something called the Trends in International Mathematics and Science Study, the so-called TIM study. And what high-performing countries do in their educational systems is something you can learn by examining that study. And so I want to talk to you about what all high-performing countries in the world do. And by the way, we have some high-performing states that do these things too. You know, and, and certainly in certain subject areas. If you looked at, at Minnesota's system of education for science, it's really quite extraordinary. But overall, the high-performing countries, whether they are first world countries always, like the Netherlands, or whether they're a country like Singapore, which in 25 years went from the bottom of the barrel to one of the highest performing nations on Earth, they have certain characteristics in common. And here's what they are. First, and I'm going to come back and talk about some of these, but first, all high-performing countries have clear, high standards for what all children will know and be able to do. And anybody who thinks that the ideas of standards is somehow anathema to us because George W. Bush was for it should remember that Bill Clinton was for it before then and that George Herbert Walker Bush with Diane Ravitch's leadership was for it before that. The idea of clear high standards for what all kids would know and be able to do is critically important. And anybody who thinks that's going away under President Obama has not been paying attention. I was in Constitution Hall when George Bush announced no child left behind. And most people don't realize that there were only four people on the stage that day. One was John Bonnier, who was the congressional leader of the Republican Party. One was a senator named Ted Kennedy. You remember him? Mm -hmm. And one was a congressman who was then the minority leader in the, in the uh, Education and Labor Committee, today the majority leader, Congressman George Miller from California. The truth is this is not a partisan idea. This is an international idea. So anybody here who doubts that standards are important is, in my view, really in denial about what high-performing countries have to do. Second, high-performing countries have matching fair assessments. I'll come back and talk about this a little more. But by fair assessments, I don't just mean multiple choice tests. Because really, the only multiple choice work you're doing today is when you went through that food line. Most of you have jobs which have almost no multiple choice involved at all. The reality is that for us to be so dependent as a nation 
on multiple choice examinations instead of the more comprehensive written examinations is quite a shame. High performing countries have curriculum frameworks that are based on their standards, they have instructional materials that are aligned to their standards, and they have aligned instruction. Every high performing nation on earth has safety nets for children with special needs. Every high performing country has teacher training and professional development that supports the coherence of all the things I've already mentioned. And coherence, if you take nothing else out of what I said today, it's coherence. It's all got to fit together. Eighth, high performing countries all have a leader who leads for results and aligns everything. And let me just say, when I left the superintendency, we had term limits in California, I first went and ran the National Institute for School Leadership, which is part of the National Center for Education and the Economy. Many of you are familiar with Mark Tucker and Judy Cotting's work. I ran a, one of their entities. I was the first executive director of NISL. And I can tell you that we were, when we were piloting the program, we were doing the beta testing in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, and the superintendent was John Fryer, and he told his principals, so the first cohort was 60 principals. He told them that he really wanted them to emphasize instructional leadership. It, he wanted them to be, to, that was their job one. And most principals think job one is either discipline or safety or picking up paper or something else besides instructional leadership. Anybody who's not clear that the job of, in, of teaching is, is the same job for the principal, principal teacher is where it comes from. That, that for principals to be distracted by other things is a terrible mistake. Job one is instruction. And yet even though these principals were told to focus in their work, even before they went through the training, but they were supposed to keep track of their time for the weeks beforehand, and they keep how much time they spent on different things, not one principal spent more than 50% of his or her time on instructional leadership. So we've gotten distracted. There's a lot of noise, you know? It's sort of like, I mean, I, I, I actually think I may have had HD, you know, uh, I can say it, but, uh, you know, I, I, I believe I had some kind of hyperactive, I, I easily get distracted by things, but, it because, but I got a lot done as a kid and as a, an adult. But still in all, it's easy to get distracted by the other stuff. And it's important that people who are in leadership programs know that job one is student achievement. Doesn't matter if you're in preschool, or in elementary school, or in middle school, or in high school, or in colleges and universities. Doesn't matter if you're helping kids that have been kicked out of school, or you're helping kids with special needs. Our job is, lead, is leadership in instruction. And so high performing countries get that. High performing countries have preschool for all, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this is, if you were to ask me what the single most important thing this country could be doing and should be doing in education, it is preschool for all. Every major country with which we compete has preschool for all. I was privileged to go to France as a guest of the French American Foundation after we had a preschool task force. And I was invited and Karen Hill Scott, who some of you know, a marvelous woman from Los Angeles, who's one of the great national leaders in preschool, she and I were part of this American contingent to go look at the preschools in France. I will tell you that at the preschools in France, it's an eight hour program, goes from eight to four. The, the municipality is responsible for the buildings, but the federal national government pays for the teacher's salary. Those teachers are in marvelous settings all day long. And yes, class sizes are actually a little bigger than I thought they would be, but because it's an eight hour program, the children have a two hour lunch period in there. At lunch, the meal is served on real china plates with real glassware and real silverware. And, and we ate what the kids ate for lunch. One day it was lam roast lamb with radicchio salad. Another day it was, a, it was an amazing salad uh, and, and marvelous breads. And yet another day we had um, the, one of the best shepherd's pies I've ever eaten in my life with salad. The, chil the only difference was in the teacher's lounge they served red wine. <laughs> but I asked the, I asked the uh, mayor of the small town outside of Paris, you know, you've got six or seven political parties here in France, from the Communist Party on the far left, your left, to the, you know, globalist party and conservative parties on the far right, and then some in, the in between. When there's a budget cut, 
which of your parties proposes cutting education? And he looked at me over his glasses in that very French way, and he said, <laughs> no one would dare. It would be the end of that party. <laughs> the truth is, we got a bunch of people in this country paying lip service to the education of children, and they're not putting their money where their mouth is. And this preschool for all, the steepest learning curve in the history of a child's life is from zero to five. There are connections that are being made in the brain called synapses, and you can only make them from zero to five. You can't come back retrospectively and retroactively put them in where they need to be. Those connections can only be made in those early years. A researcher at the University of California at Berkeley looked at the s development of vision in children. And she hypothesized that a child that was born with everything neurologically fine, except the child was born with a cataract, or two cataracts, that that child would never learn to see if the cataracts were not removed before the child was 18 months old. She tested this on primates. Some of you won't like that, but that's what she did. She sewed the eyes of primaries, primates shut and then opened them up 18 months later, later and every single one of those primates was blind. The truth is our failure to provide preschool for all is a national failure of vision about the future of our children. And I will tell you, I think it's the next big idea in America. The last thing that all um, <coughs> high-performing countries have is a comprehensive plan to provide post-secondary training to all their students. And again, I had a chance to be a guest of the German Marshall Fund, and we went with a group of people to visit. Half of our group, about eight people, went to Germany and Scotland. So they saw a large country, a small country. And half of the group, the half I was with, went to England and to Denmark. And then we came together at the end. And we talked on the seventh day. We each had three days in each country. We came together to talk about what we'd seen. Now, Bill Schmidt, who runs Tim's, was on this study. Mark Tucker and Judy Cotting were on this study. So these were some of the leading thinkers in, in America. And we were prepared to be impressed. We were astounded. We were absolutely astounded. I went to Denmark. I'd just gotten off the plane. And we went to visit these kids in a, in, in a non-college bound program for future carpenters. And I was talking to this young man and I said, did you feel shortchanged that you didn't go to gymnasium, that you weren't being set up to go to college? He said, no, no. I did not want to go to college. I want to be a carpenter. And eventually I hope to be a contractor as my father was. I'm hoping that I will be able to build houses and modernize houses. And this program allows me to have three months of an apprenticeship and then I will go out and work for eight months. I have my month's vacation. And then I will come back and next year I will only go to school for six weeks and then I will work and have my month's vacation. And then I will come for a month and then I will have 10 months of work and then I'll have my month's vacation. And then I will be fully uh, trained as a journeyman carpenter. And hopefully in within 10 years I will be my own contractor. And I realize I'm having this conversation in Denmark with this young man who's 17 and not a college-bound youth, and we're having the conversation in English. And so I complimented him. I said, you know, your English is very good. And he's shy. He said, oh, it's not nearly as good as my French, German, or Italian. <laughs> so here we are in countries where they're looking at their kids, whether they're college-bound or not college-bound, and opening doors for them, and opening vistas for them, and opening opportunities for them by assuming that, of course, everyone should speak more than one language, and it shouldn't just be done that way. So I want to come back and, and come back to this issue of standards, because I think it's really important that everybody here understand that one of the, and, and the assessments, one of the biggest shortcomings in America, and certainly in California, is that we only have content standards. And that tends to drive assessments that are multiple choice. If you don't get to have performance standards, then you really don't get the richness of education. You know, content is jump. Performance is how high. How high is excellent? How high is good? How high is OK? How high is subpar? How high is unacceptable? The truth is you can't just say jump. You have to say, you can't just say that you have an ability to understand uh, an essay, you have to be able to write and communicate about that essay. Myrna and Levy, Myrna and Levy wrote a great book called Teaching the New Basic Skills about 20 years ago, and they said, it isn't enough that you 
be able to memorize a few facts, especially in a world where information doubles every two years. You can't memorize enough. Sure, you have to know your multiplication tables. I'm for that. I'm for you knowing your alphabet. I'm for you knowing some, some facts. But the real key, according to Murnane and Levy, is in fact that you have to be able to use information. You have to be able to think critically. You've got to be able to write. You've got to be able to analyze. You've got to be able to find defects. The new basic skills are much more about working in groups. None of you work alone, do you? Of course you have to learn to work with people. And some of the most extraordinary, I could, I could launch off on about 10 different tangents about this, but the truth is the, some of the most extraordinary changes that have been made in, in manufacturing, for example, in this country have been about people learning to work together in groups. You cannot, you cannot have a team if, if, if people don't understand this. And so we've gone, I would argue, from in California when I got there, there were no standards, there were no assessments, and there were no was no system of accountability. In truth, we really worked hard on the standards, and then we got really hijacked. The original legislation said they had to be content and performance. But some of the people, and, and here's the problem in education, I would argue with all of you. We have too many extremists. And so w everybody wants to do it either this way or that way. So I'm convinced that the whole language people are the people that could read when they were four. They thought phonics was really boring and they hated phonics. So they said, let's get rid of phonics, one of my predecessors. But then along comes a bunch of kids that don't learn to read because they need phonics. And so we go to the other extreme. We go to direct instruction and phonics, phonics, phonemic awareness. But there's a, that kid that could read at four finds this really boring. What you need is the whole panoply of tools in the teacher's toolbox. So the teacher can figure out how to work with each style of learning. These kids are not McDonald's Happy Meals. They are not all alike. And uh, so many of the kids that I'm, I'm convinced, so many of the kids that are in some of the programs for kids that have been kicked out of school, whether it's because of you know, bad behavior or whether, well, any one of a dozen reasons. But the truth is I taught at the Youth Authority I, I, when I was very early on in my career, I found a bunch of talented kids, most of whom's parents should have been in jail, not the kids. And, and, but beyond that, all over California, I meet more kids who dropped out because of boredom than because it was too hard, because they didn't know why they were there. And I will tell you, in the highest performing countries, kids do know why they're learning stuff. They do learn, it, often in Europe, European countries, but in some Asian countries, when kids are still in middle school, they go do job shadowing. They go find out, you know, how many kids have you met that said, well, I want to be, uh, be a mechanic, but I hate math. You know, if you expose them to what a mechanic really does and they get why they need the math, it's all of a sudden a lot better for them. And that's true for carpenters. That's you. I had a guy in Orange County one time, he was big, you know, Orange County. It's an interesting part of my state. There's a lot of wonderful people there, and some of them are my friends. But one guy was at the Chamber of Commerce. He's wearing more gold than I own, you know, on his chains around his neck. And he got up and said, you know, you're always talking about these kids needing, uh, you know, needing special skills. You know, not every kid is headed for college. Some of them are going to be machinists and mechanics and, and carpenters, and they don't need all this algebra and geometry. I said, what interesting choices of jobs you picked. See, I'm the machinist's daughter. My dad taught machinists to be machinists in the Navy. They know trigonometry, thank you very much. And you better bloody be glad, those of you who flew here, that they do. Because when that wing assembly lifts up, you take a good look at that wing assembly. That's maintained by a machinist who knows trigonometry. The mechanic who dismounted your plane engine and overhauled it, we hope he was well trained. We hope he knew a little algebra and a little geometry, don't you? And of course, the carpenter, would this building even be standing? if the carpenter didn't know geometry. The truth is that we've got to engage these students by making what we're teaching them relevant to the real world. And that's what high performing countries do. In high performing countries, by the way, teachers feel valued. And that's true in high performing states as well. Rand did a study in 2000s call, called uh, Improving Student Achievement. And they found there were five characteristics in high performing states. Number one, high per, higher per pupil spending. I'm sorry, this is the only enterprise in the world that I know where people say money doesn't really matter. Hello, money really does matter. 
and it really does matter that we invest in our kids' education. Second, high-performing states have public pre-kindergarten programs. Guess what? That's what high-performing countries have. High-performing states have smaller class sizes in elementary education. I fought to do that in California right now. This governor and this legislature are eviscerating that program. I'm, tr I'm sad about it. Because let me tell you something about California. Something you all, the, the, we got a few Californians here, I know. But there's a little jingle I was taught when I was in school. So sing, my friends, be blithe, be gay, or weep, my friends, with sorrow. What California is today, the rest will be tomorrow. The truth is that 42%, not to 25%, the many national politicians use in an uninformed way, but 42% of the kids in California, kindergarten through 12th grade, speak a language other than English at home. 50% of our kindergarten kids do. A friend of mine, Chauncey Veach, who was the National Teacher of the Year out of a tough part of our state, was going around the country as the National Teacher. You go around and give speeches. Chauncey was in Iowa and somebody said, this may be a problem for you in California, but it isn't a problem here in Iowa. We just don't have that many kids who are English learners. We don't have that many kids who even have backgrounds from other states. This was about 10 years ago. Chauncey said, would somebody get me a phone book? So the, they, somebody went out and got it. He said, I'm serious. He kept talking, but they brought him the phone book and he opens up the phone book and says, oh, look, five pages of Fernandez. Oh, look, six pages of Hernandez. Oh, look, seven pages of Lopez. The truth is, whether you're conscious of it, and I think everyone in this room is, but there are a lot of people that haven't been conscious of it. But now, all of a sudden, when I go to the family reunion in Kentucky, I'm waited on by Hispanics and Asians. And it's been that way in New Orleans for a long time, but it's increasingly that way across the Midwest, all over the country. The reality is that we are a very diverse nation, and we are either going to use that as a rich resource for our are building our wealth as a nation, or we are going to be in deep yogurt very soon. And I would argue that in high-performing countries, you find smaller class sizes in early elementary education. You also find teachers feel valued. Teachers do not move around a lot. There's not a high turnover in high-performing states, and teachers report they have adequate resources. The latter four probably follow up from the first one which is adequate resources. But I just want to stress here, I have been to schools where incompetent or crooked people have money and wasted it. It does happen. Not a lot. Happened in Compton, California. Happened in Richmond, California. There have been evil people. So that's why you can't just say we're going to spend more money. That's why you got to have high standards. That's why you got to hold people accountable. The truth is, though, that most today, uh, and I would argue that highly effective principals in this country and highly effective superintendents, and I have never been to a great school that doesn't have a great principal. I've never been to a great district that doesn't have a great superintendent, unless he or she just left. The truth is that leadership is really about bringing out the talents of all of your people, bringing and making everybody at the school feel valued and important. In the great schools that I have visited, it isn't just the teachers who feel important and who are adult role models. It's every adult at the school. I fought to put gardens in every school in California. You may think I'm goofy, but the truth is that kids who have gardens will eat vegetables. In fact, they love vegetables. I had an inner city kid in Oakland who'd actually been in trouble with the law who said, I never liked lettuce. I never liked salad, because lettuce always tasted like the refrigerator. But this arugula, now this stuff is really good. I've had inner city kids and, and kids who didn't think they liked vegetables waxing philosophic about fava beans and showing me the difference between growing a beet and growing a carrot. The truth is, in a highly valued school, the principal treats the school's uh, nurse and the school aide and the school custodian, who's helping keep maintain the garden if we're doing this right, as well as the people working in the cafeteria as adult leaders for children. Every adult is treated with respect and dignity. I have to say that I believe, I visited over 500 schools while I was superintendent of public instruction in the state of California. I visited well over 600 at this point. I serve on the boards of a few school district, two, few charter schools and a few special programs for especially at-risk kids. I stay active in my gardens and schools program as well as in my local school district. But I have to tell you something. 
I'm more convinced than ever that hands-on learning is, is absolutely essential to really connecting kids with their information. So you really want to teach science? You go to the garden. You really want to teach science? You go to the kitchen. You really want to, I mean, we ought to be doing much more of this with our kids. And we created cu curriculum guides for teaching not only the uh, <coughs> sciences, but mathematics. All the early math breakthroughs are in gardening, really farming, as we called it. But the truth is, you really want to get kids involved in history? A great avenue to do that is through talking about agriculture. And, and kids should know that food doesn't come from the store. They should know where it comes from. The, the reality is that if you really want to ca have kids write about authentic experiences, and in many of our states, certainly in California, you're not supposed to write about your family because they've got laws passed that say they don't want you to intrude in people's families. Well, what kind of authentic experiences do you write about in the third or fourth grade if it isn't your family? Well, you can write about what you did in the garden. Garden is a great place to teach the arts as well. I will just say that I, I'm convinced that when I think about the future of my country, I worry because I really do believe that for the same reason great business enterprises are successful because they have great leaders, that great military enterprises are su su successful because we invest so much in teaching leadership to the people that lead our military. The average beginning person in the military is shocked by how much time they spend in the military. My number two at Nissel was, used to be provost of the War College, retired colonel in the Air Force. He said, Delane, I was in the military for 30 years. I spent 10 years going to school. Education is important. It's essential. It's vital. But we also have to make sure that as school leaders, we're constantly thinking about the education of our staff and including them. Sadly, many school leaders today, and, and I'm, I, I have to tell you, I think President Obama is on the right track with Race to the Top. I'm sorry. It, we aren't running the schools for the benefit of the grown-ups. We're running them for the children. And the idea that we would disconnect, <coughs> that we would not include student achievement in an evaluation of teachers is nuts. You know what the research shows. There's more difference between two fourth grade teachers at the same school than between the fourth grades at two schools. The reality is we don't do enough to foster the kind of collaboration that really makes great leadership work at schools. You know, in Japan, I've been to Japanese schools. I was a guest of the Japanese Ministry of Education. I used to send five teachers every year. And they always wanted me to go. So after I got reelected, I said, all right, I'm going to go with this five. I used to pick five of my teachers of the year. I went to Japan. You know about Japanese lesson study? Japanese, the, the typical, ja and there's a few schools in California that are doing this, and there's some, I'm sure, in some of your states. But in Japan, let's say we had a, an elementary school. We were all fourth grade teachers in the elementary school. We would all visit your classroom. The three of us would come to your classroom one day. Our kids would either have a substitute and or they would go to a, some kind of exercise and or they would do a movie. But we would all come and watch you teach. And we would look and say, well, well, I loved what Arlene did with that disruptive little boy in the back. She has great classroom management skills. And we, we would go around and we would all comment to each other. And it works so much. It's, it's, it's the kind of teamwork and the kind of work that we just take for granted in the private sector. The truth is, we need to take the time to learn from one another and to build teamwork, not just have the principal come in and see how you're doing. The truth is, more of that collaboration. At one school I went to in San Mateo, it was marvelous. They had a new teacher, and she was getting a lot of classroom management skills. She, in turn, was imparting a lot of technology skills to some of the more veteran teachers. It was a win-win for everyone. And, and why shouldn't we be sharing lesson plans and, and ideas? We should, of course, be. We should be building teams at schools. Sadly, though, most school leaders will tell you that they not only lack adequate financial resources, they live in a climate of low expectations for their students, at least most of their students. They live with limited faculty capacity and not the ability to put these teams together. They lack the authority to get the job done. If you're going to move a t principal or fire her, him or her because their kids didn't achieve, then you've got to give them some additional authority and responsibility. And of course, many argue that they don't have time to be an instructional leader. I will just tell you, I'm a big believer in your programs. I, yes, think we need PhDs, but one, one of the things I fought long and hard for in California was EDD programs, which my University of California, the only doctoral granting institution in those days, 
resisted doing for many years. And we finally, we had an education roundtable which was made up of the head of the UC, CSU, community colleges and private colleges and the California Post-Secondary Education Commission. And together we talked about this and UC was intractable. And finally, we went and uh, Jan Holmgren at Mills went back and did an ed leadership program. And that's what you guys have done, but UC is just beginning in California to move into being more user friendly. I went down to Riverside, I started to tell this story to your provost. I went down to Riverside at the invitation of uh, Glenn Auerbach, who's Chancellor of Riverside, to, to try to convince them to do an ed leadership program. And the faculty, who were, happened to be all men, uh, said to me, you know, they, let me see if I understand this. You're suggesting that we offer classes in the evenings and on weekends to working professional, the body language was <laughs> completely this, you know. Uh, I said, yes, that's what I'm suggesting. And this is what these professionals need. And another, uh, one of the professors said, I don't think, and by the way, the chancellor was with me and so was the dean, Bob Calfee, who'd been at Stanford and I knew well. They both were with me on this. And one guy said, I don't think you get it. We don't want a bunch of 30 something, 40 something, or God forbid 50 something year old students wandering around our campus. We want 20-somethings that want to be professors just like us. Well, you know what? We better get a little more flexible here, and we better figure out how to get more people like the people in this room into programs of educational leadership. I'm still for research, but what good is research in a country which lacks vision and courage and heart? And that's the thing I'll talk about a little bit more tonight. But, but leadership is really what I wanted to emphasize today. And I, I want to give you one story that I find so revealing. Back in the late 70s and early 80s, when I first met Constance and was working in the private sector, there was a wonderful story about Ford Motor Company. And I actually went to a training AT&T put on, and they said, you know, all these companies, and you can remember some of them. Remember W.T. Grants? Remember Sylvania? Remember Studebaker? Packer? Remember? These companies used to be around, and now they're gone because they didn't change. And at that time, there was a lot of hypothesis that Ford was not going to be around anymore because Ford wasn't changing. So they got a new leader. His name was Donald Peterson. He became CEO of Ford. And he immediately called together his designers. And he asked them to tell him about next year's cars. And a room full of people about like this, they began to tell him about the next year's models and what they were proposing. And finally, Donald Peterson said, now tell me, are these cars that you want to buy? Here's one of the problems in America, whether it's in the public sector or the private sector, big company, small company, a lot of people tell the boss what he or she wants to hear. They don't stand up and say, no, this isn't what I want to do. So most of them kind of mumble. But one brave guy named Jack Telnack looked Donald Peterson in the eye and said, no, this is not the car I want to drive. And Peterson said, good. Then go and design for me the car that you want to drive. And Jack Telnack and his team came back with a design for a car called the Ford Taurus, which saved Ford's, Ford Motor Company's uh, future and, in fact, became the number one selling car in America for more than 10 years. Later, when Peterson was named Corporate Leader of the Year by Fortune magazine, he said, I feel funny taking this award. I feel like a turtle on a fence post. You know, when you see a turtle on a fence post, you know it didn't get there by itself. I always say that great leaders are not afraid to hire people as smarter, smarter than they are and to encourage them to share and to work together and to be a team. I think it works in the private sector. I think it works in the public sector. But I want to tell you something else. The defense of America has more to do with the education of our children than building an anti-missile system or putting a person on Mars. The defense of our country is now and always has been about well-educated communities that dream of better lives for themselves and perhaps most of all for their children. Today in America, most low-wage workers will never move into the middle class. That was not true for this country a generation ago. According to a study by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the economies of France, Italy, Britain, Germany, Denmark, Finland, and Sweden provide more, provide more mobility for low-wage workers than the United States. If we are going to change that and, and create an opportunity, not just for economic development, but for social competence, we are going to have to improve the education of our children. 
Neil Postman said, children are a message we send to a time we will never see. It is one of my favorite quotes. And I worry about the children today who are sending to a time we will never see. I know that my parents' generation was generous and visionary about the future. They actually didn't have a lot of research. It's something more, courage and vision and heart. That's what I think we've been mi missing. I will quote again from Friedman. He said, in the flat world, the frontiers of knowledge get pushed out farther and farther, faster and faster. And America either needs to be training that brain power itself or importing it from somewhere else, or ideally both, if it wants to dominate the 21st century the way it dominated the 20th. And that simply is not happening. Susan B. Anthony said, cautious, careful people, always casting about to preserve their reputation and social standing can never bring about a reform. So I'm telling you, I hope that you will be brave and bold. I hope that you will move forward in the places that you are working and really have great visions for all of our kids, including the ones that, in fact, may seem like they're not paying close attention. We have much to work to do as a nation, and I really do believe, though, it has to do with educating each and every child at each and every school and each and every college and each and every preschool, what you're all doing. Some years ago, when the contract on America was declared, I had just been elected state superintendent. It was 1995, and I was asked to come to Congress to debate Lamar Alexander, who'd been Secretary of Education under the first George Bush. And I, I was asked, is there any justifiable federal role in education? And if so, where in the Constitution did I find it? I quoted from the preamble, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States. Our posterity, the only interest group important enough to be named in the Constitution. Those were lofty goals in 1787, but I think it is time for us to renew our commitment to that document and to the goals that those good people had even back then. The reality is that we have a great opportunity in America and we have a great danger. I think the reason I'm here is there's more opportunity in this room than there is danger. And so I want to encourage you all to be brave and bold and to do this important work with great heart, with vision, and with courage. Thank you all very much for the chance to be with you. <clears throat> I would actually suggest that one of the reasons I think that we downplayed career education in high schools across America and in middle schools as well for many years was that we had such a big military that we just sort of relied on the military to train the plumbers and the machinists and the mechanics and so forth. Be and we used to have selective service, so everybody was required to do some service, and I think a lot of people got trained. My brother was a plumber, and he was trained by the United States Navy. My father was a machinist who was trained by the Navy. So uh, I will tell you that I believe that uh, we had a program in California which still is, exists, although it's been on shaky ground, called Troops to Teachers. And I think we could do a lot more to invite some of our, uh, some of our troops who are in service right now who are going to hopefully get, we'll get done with these two wars in the Middle East. And we will have a lot of people coming home with great skill and a great opportunity to recruit them into our colleges, I mean, into, well, into our colleges too, but especially into our high schools and middle schools. I've seen, we have... Uh, not done a great job in California. I worked really hard on career and technical education, and we did strengthen it a little bit in my time there. I've seen amazing programs work, and I've met the kids that were, I met a young woman who was going to drop out of high school because she had a job working as a receptionist in, a, in an architectural firm, and she was bored. She frankly was bored. She didn't know why she was going to school. And so she got into an ROP in San Jose, one of our better programs, to learn drafting. And she learned computer-assisted design and wound up not going to work at the drafting firm but going to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo to become an architect herself. She couldn't even envision herself being an architect because she didn't, you know, too many of these kids don't know why they're learning this stuff. I'll talk about this a little tonight, but, you know, Nietzsche, when, uh, Nietzsche once had the line, 
he who has a why to live can bear with almost any how. And it was what Viktor Frankl quoted when he was, he was asked how he survived the Holocaust. He who has a why to live can bear with almost any how. I know so, I've met so many kids in my career, some unfortunately in the California Youth Authority or in you know, the criminal justice programs because they got out of high school with no skill and they never felt they were getting close to having a skill and they didn't know why they were there and they got in trouble. So it's my belief, I work with a group now run by a rabbi in Sacramento using all the churches in the Sacramento area with public school kids, some of whom are incarcerated youth, to try to get them into doing, uh, preparing produce boxes for California. Uh, we have this community service boxes, they're called, and they're local produce, and we, can, we you know, sell them essentially. But these kids, you know, a lot of them uh, reading at the third grade level, math at the sixth grade level maybe, have never really had applied learning at all. And now they're back enrolled in high school, they're back getting their degrees, and they're learning a skill. And then we've got a bunch of other programs where the kids are actually doing something, hands-on doing something. And they're not only finishing high school, but some of them are going to two and four year colleges. I think we have to get every kid an understanding that every kid needs some post-secondary training. This is not 1950. And oh, by the way, the boring jobs are the ones where you don't need any training. The really interesting jobs are where you have to get some training. It's interesting to build a building or to fix a car or to do any uh, one of a dozen jobs that don't require a four-year degree. But I, again, have met so many of these kids that didn't think they wanted a four-year degree who got hooked on something and wound up going to college. I think what's worrying me, and I didn't speak a lot in this speech about higher education, what's worrying me a lot is that we not only are losing middle school and high school kids, but we're also making it look completely impossible to go to college. And all across America, you know, in most of Europe, they learned it from us. Most of Europe, it's so much easier to go to college than it was 50 years ago. In America, it's so much harder. You know what I paid to go to the University of California in 1965? $82.50 a semester. Right now, so the, the, they, my parents had to borrow money, so it was, they estimated my entire year cost would be $1,550. Right now, the estimate of the University of California in, in California is over $30,000 a year. And inflation, when inflation was 1,000%, the cost of education in higher ed has gone up 20,000%. So, you know, we have to not only get kids to, to careers, but also get them engaged in a way that some of them, more of them, will want to go to college. And that scares me that we're not doing that. I didn't spend much time on the arts, but Mernane and Levy talk about the new basic skills. There's another guy named Schlain, I think it's S-C-H-L-A-I-N or some such thing, and he's written Art and Physics. And he talks about how the whole right brain is really where you do creativity. And it isn't just where you do art and music, it's also where you do physics and engineering. And so in truth, the, a quarter of the jobs in this, I had an arts task force in California that was really amazing, and I had a wonderful group of people that participated in it. And, and we had, I, had, I may have mentioned this, I know I told Connie, Constance, I had the, all these people knocking on my door saying, I have to be on that task force. But it wasn't just artists and museums and art galleries, it was the software industry. It was the motion picture industry. John Hughes of Rhythm and Hughes, who testified on the bill to create art standards in California that I got Sheila Kuehl, Senator Kuehl, to carry. John Hughes got up and testified that he thought that he was being shortchanged as a taxpayer in California, that we weren't giving our kids enough art. And that if he got a kid that had lots of technology but no art, and versus a kid who had arts and never had technology, he'd take the kid with the arts and no technology because he could teach him the technology at 18 but he couldn't teach him the art. The truth is that, that Bach was a mathematician. This is not new. This didn't just happen. There was a, you know, Mozart used to have his wife read to him so he could occupy the left brain while he was composing with the right brain. A very famous composer had a, did his best work after he had a stroke on the right side of his brain. So the arts are not a frill. The arts are a basic skill. Think about, you know, the design of your, when you go to a restaurant while you're here, you'll see that there's, there's a decor in the restaurant. The menu has a design. The food is artistic. 
the, the, you know, every, the clothes that you're wearing. Think about even though we're all struggling educators. The, we spend a lot of money on design. We spend a lot of money on the arts. And the arts are not a frill. And in Europe and in Japan, you know, you think of the Japanese as such a very rigid, no. Every kid in elementary school has music, has art, has calligraphy, has design, has gardens. These are not, uh, we have a picture of the world that is not fair to our kids. And oh, by the way, I always say you save this one with art and that one with music. This one with sports and that one with science. This one with English, that one with mathematics. This one you save because you had a garden in the school. And that one you save because that teacher was there who was a mentor to that child. Because the, the research on dysfunctionality in this country shows that over 70% of the kids in dysfunctional families grow up to be functional adults. They have two things in common. A mentor other than a parent, most commonly a teacher, and more education than their parents got. This is the solution to social ill and lots of other things. And I say to you, if you did not come from a dysfunctional family, I've lived long enough to know you either married somebody from a dysfunctional family, <laughs> or your best friend was from a dysfunctional family. Me, I'm a triple dipper. <laughs> but the truth is that, that uh, for many of these kids, I have a friend who's a wonderful artist and an art, was an art teacher at Hillsborough High, High School in California. She's since retired. She had kids who came to school to go to her class. That's why they came to school. You want them to get this other stuff? They came to go to her class. And I'll, I'll just tell you, that's why you can't afford to just have math, math and English language arts and English language arts and math. That was one of the things wrong with No Child Left Behind. It said you only had to teach science in two grades. Well, I've been to schools in California and in other states where they only teach science in two grades because it's only tested in fifth and eighth grade. Well, you don't test art at all. So school, some schools aren't even offering it. And you're losing those kids over there. You lost these over here because you didn't teach science, those because you didn't teach history. It's just tragic to me. And again, if you want to talk about the defense of this country, then good, I want to talk about that too. And it's called education, education, education. It's the greatest tragedy of my lifetime. And here's my advice to you. First, I do think we all have to, I'm going to say this a little bit tonight, but I actually do think we all have to get more political. We really do. And we have to do it in a couple of ways. Not only do you need to belong to political groups and the special groups that support education, but you also have to begin to educate the policymakers. The worst, time, worst way to educate a policymaker is to go to their office in the state capitol. Because they're like, I always said it was like, I was like I was a TV and I had 150 channels and somebody else had my channel changer. You get like five minutes on a topic. You are just moving so quickly. Even if you want to focus on education, you still have to be on four other committees. You still got, you know, you're running hither and thither. The speaker calls you. You've got to go to hearings. You've got to go testify. You've got to go to the floor. It's, it's an amazing. You really want to get some time on the legislator? Invite them to your school. In California, they, they're in session from Monday through Thursday, but they're in their district on Friday. You get real quality time. But then you can't just bring them to the new school with the new buildings and the new stuff and the, and the toniest kids and from the, not, you know, from the most affluent families. You gotta take them in and show them that room that's got the mold in it. You gotta take them and show them that room where the special ed kids are crawling around on a, on a dirty floor. You gotta take them in and show them how, how decrepit some of these schools are. I tell you, kids are young but they're not saps. They've been to the mall. We tell them education is important, but if they go to their school and it's a drafty dump, they get that we're really lying to them. The schools ought to look, they ought to look like we're serious about education. And, they, and w there ought to be a music room in the elementary classrooms, and as well as the middle schools and the high schools. There ought, to be, there ought to be science labs that are up to date. I went to Lowell High School in San Francisco, one of the most high performing high schools in the nation. And there are wires hanging from the ceiling because David Packard had graduated from there and he decided he wanted to wire them for technology so he just went in and did it. But nobody had really thought about it. It looked like, you know, kind of a tenement. The, now the kids were getting good results because, you know, the most important thing, if they, if they offer me great classrooms and a lousy teacher versus a great teacher teaching from a rock like Socrates, I'll take the great teacher on the rock. But somehow we've got to make this a value that America holds for all of its children. 
And it can't just be for the kids who can afford to pay $30,000 a year, which people are paying in California to go to private schools. 34 in San Francisco, 40 in Los Angeles. But, but even the Catholic schools in California are hitting 20,000. Truth is that all over this country, we, have, we are disinvesting in education, and that's like disinvesting in your future. And I, 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 was, I once debated Milton Friedman when they were trying to have a voucher in California. He's a smart man, and I have respect for his intellect. But some guy got up and said, I'm with Mr. Friedman, you know. I can't be worried about other people's children. I'm just worried about my kids. I said, do you fly? You know, this is where I first came up with this analogy. He said, yeah, what's that got to do with it? I said, well, next time you're on a plane, remember that that wing assembly is being maintained by somebody else's child. Now, that engine that got dismounted and overhauled and remounted, that was done by somebody else's child. Now, that pilot up in the cockpit, he's somebody else's child. And the air traffic controller who sees you and your family safely home, that's somebody else's child. The truth is, this country can't go anywhere unless we're thinking about other people's children. And we just haven't been doing a very good job of that. So it starts with making teachers feel like they feel in Japan, like they are valued. And that doesn't mean we don't hold them accountable. I'm, I'm actually very clear that we do need to, we, you don't get, just get to teach the rest of your life because you're a teacher and you're tenured. In my view, if, you, if the kids aren't getting results, then you can't be a teacher anymore. So I'm okay with do, holding people accountable. But I'm also clear that you can't, look, they shorten the school year. I got us up to 180 days. We had been at 175. I got us to 180. Now we're back down to 175. Look out. Hawaii just went to 163. But you know what the rest of the world's kids do? The rest of the world, Europe, all those kids go to school 200 days a year. That's an additional month. In Asia, they go 220 to 260 days. That's an additional two to three months. I'm not making this stuff up. You can go check it out. The, and what, ha what that does, of course, is it raises teacher salaries. So now you get teacher salaries. I mean, in California, I have, I've met teachers that have a summer job in the Silicon Valley. They make more in the two months they work in the Silicon Valley than they make the nine months they're teaching. They love to teach, so they keep doing it. But we can't be doing that. And that's why you got so many non-credential people. That's why you got so many people that, that don't have a degree in science teaching the science classes, don't have a degree in math teaching the math classes, because those people all went to make a living wage. Look, I live in California. Some of you live in really expensive states. California is really expensive. We're losing a ton of teachers because they've just given up. They have to live 60 miles from where they work. They, they're driving. I mean, the principals can't afford to live in Palo Alto. I met a principal who was driving from Modesto and, and literally got a job in Modesto. And, was, and he said, I hate to leave Palo Alto because it's really, there are certain districts in California where they spend a lot of money on kids. It's a long story. but. Prop 13 really lowered overall spending, but there's a few very Tony districts that get to spend $20,000 a year, kids. Palo Alto is one of them. But if you can't afford to live in Palo Alto, and you're commuting two hours a day, and you don't see your own children, then you take a job somewhere else. So we're losing teachers, we're losing principals, and, and worse than that, we're not enough mid-career people are thinking about it as an option because, because we haven't made it very attractive. We ought to be cheap treating teachers as if they have the most important job in America, because they do. And we ought to be treating principals as, prin as we do generals and admirals. We ought to treat them as if they are absolutely essential to the success of our enterprise, because they are. As are the deans, as are the professors, as are the educators in preschool. All of this is important work, the most important work facing us. But we are not the only game in town anymore and we better wake up and smell the coffee, or we are going to become a second world country in my lifetime. I'm hoping for a long life, but having said that, I don't want that to happen. I want us to be the great United States of America where every kid feels they have a future and a destiny. And yes, that includes the kid who's in a wheelchair. That includes the kids who's dyslexic, who's, got, who's severely disabled. The truth is the promise of America is a promise that that we're going to find the dyslexic kids and, and give them a chance. And guess what? They'll grow up to be Tom Cruise and Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> you know, we've got a bunch of kids who have real special needs, but they also have real contributions to make. And yes, including the kids that are in our criminal justice system, because we failed them already. Let's not do it a second time. I can't, we can't afford the prison system we're running in America, and we certainly can't afford a pr Cadillac prison system and jalopy schools. 
Thank you all very much.